Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm just so glad to see you all here today. We've got two fantastic guests. Now, today, we are continuing our series of Paradigm Conversations. Uh, this is a partnership we have with the Bringing to Theory Paradigm Project, uh, which we're trying to hold uh, conversations that advance that project's mission of advancing higher education's reform oriented towards improving student success with an eye towards justice and improving higher education and more. Uh, you can learn more about that on our website and you can also learn about it today as we talk. Our focus right now is on advancing student access, uh, student success on campus, but doing so in an equitable way. Uh, we're doing so that it's not reproduced patterns of injustice, but in fact is actually fair and just. We've got two wonderful people who are doing great projects across the country, and we're going to bring them both on stage one by one. So to begin with, uh, let me see if I can get Denise Bartel up on stage. And there you are. <laughs> Good there afternoon. You Good to see you. Where have we found you today? Uh, you have found me in my very new office. So um, we moved homes a couple of days ago. So what you see behind you is um, is is basically the unpacking in progress. Um, and I am in Hudson, Ohio, located near Kent State. Oh, wow. Very good. Which is where you work. Yes, um, it is. Well, first of all, thank you for making time during a house move, which is bonkers. Um, and uh, <laughs> I... I as as a book person, I look at those shelves and I just I just want to fill them with titles, which I'm sure you're going to do uh, with a great deal That's of pleasure. What those boxes are. <laughs> oh yes, as, uh, Denise, if if I can call you Denise, um, yeah. tell us, besides unpacking, which is kind of like Christmas Day, right? What are you going to be working on for the next year in your position? What's what's going to be? What are the big projects and and what are the big ideas? So I am in a relatively interesting position. I'm actually in a new position um, than the position that I was hired into at Kent State University um, almost two years ago. And this is a position that is focused exclusively on supporting our regional campus system. So we have seven campuses in Kent State that are not part of the main Kent campus. They serve an area that is approximately the size of the state of Connecticut and over 8,000 students. And they serve a really vital mission in our Northeast Ohio community to provide access to students who likely otherwise would not have access to higher education. So my position is to help think uh, about how we can, as a system, move forward. And so centralizing the ways that we are thinking about student success, and in particular, thinking about the role of faculty in access and in equitable student success, particularly on a regional system. So over the next year, my job is going to be to help the faculty and the seven campuses unify, centralize, figure out how to collaborate and coordinate efforts in order to be able to be as efficient as possible while maintaining that vitally important access mission that we have in the regional system. Whoa, I was gonna say you and what army? That's a huge task. Oh my gosh. The army of faculty who are our partners in this work. Yeah. Oh, that's tremendous, especially centralizing this. And in Ohio, uh, this is a challenging environment with, um, you know, uh, the demographics are kind of uh, kind of tricky. And um, a lot of uh, and the politics around this are also tricky. Oh, my gosh. What a, what a great project. I, I love how this is focused on expanding access um, to, uh, to a population. That's terrific. Uh, and, and when did you start this job? So this particular job started in February. Um, so I've been at um, just under three months. However, the work that I have been doing with the faculty on the regional campuses has been ongoing for almost a year and a half. And so I have been fortunate enough to work with over 100 of them at this point. Um, and they have been developing communities of transformation with each other to really start thinking about how they can utilize evidence-based practices in supportive communities, not just of practice, but of transformation. And one of the things that 
you know, in doing this work, we all have realized is that we need to create conditions where our students thrive, but to do so, we have to create the same conditions for ourselves. And that's especially important in the kind of time that you were just talking about in higher education. Mm -hmm. So for example, how can we expect to create classroom spaces where all of our students feel as if they belong, if some of our faculty don't feel as if they belong at the institution. And so these communities are really intended to provide a space where faculty can come together and work together and provide for each other that sense of respect and community and support that's so vitally important for us now in this work. Mm, that sounds magnificent. Um, that that really is so important. I well, and I, I hope we can pick your brains collaboratively to figure out how you're going to be doing this because that's um, uh, that's really really ambitious and so important to do. And and by the way, friends, if you're if you're new to the paradigm conversations or to the paradigm project, that's what it's about uh, is trying to really transform higher education, not just to tweak around the edges, but to really do the deep work of this kind of uh, revolutionary change. Well, hold on one second there, Denise. Let me bring up your, uh, bring your, your colleague, your uh, co-panelist here uh, on stage, and let's make sure that Mary Beth Love can join us. Here we go. Good morning, and good. thank you, thank you for having me. Oh, greetings! It's so good to see you. Um, yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I am so sorry. I really, I had us on for two because I mixed up our time zone. <laughs> Time so, are the devil. I, 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 I'm telling you, I swear to God. So thank you so much. And uh, thanks, David, for doing a little text to me to say, hey, where are you? <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm glad you, you can did see, that. I'm, you can see I'm outside. I'm in beautiful Golden Gate Park in the uh, Arboretum. I was taking a walk. Well, I uh, think but that... I found myself a shady um, uh, spot. And um, I... So, Brian, I anticipated your first question from how uh, my colleague responded. And is would you repeat it? Oh, sure. The question is, um, how do you, uh, what are you working on for the next year? Uh, what are the projects? Uh, what are the ideas that are uppermost in your mind? Well, uh, you know, I run a, a, a program for historically underserved students. We serve about a third of the freshmen at San Francisco State and have 13 academies across the six campus uh, colleges on campus. Um, so my what I'm working on for the next year is how to translate a lot of what we've learned to the larger institution. Wow. Um, the larger institution has adopted I mean, many of the things that we have been doing. Um, Metro started in 2007, so we are a mature program. And as student success became more in focus for the entire higher education enterprise, um, a lot of the things that we had been doing, um, uh, you know, are kind of common sense. Uh, things like you know, texting students, calling students, you know, that kinds of that kind of thing. Uh, we really led that on campus and a lot of those uh, practices um, the administration has now taken on. But there are many things that we do that are really quite different. And, you know, when you say uh, that in higher education, we're facing this huge change, I, I don't think any of us can imagine the kinds of change that we're in for, at least that's, you know, everybody that I listen to who's talking about us being the T generation, the transition generation, because mm -hmm. of, you know, um, progress in biotech and AI and, and uh, uh, other areas. So transformation is going to be important. It is sitting on our head at San Francisco <laughs> State. I mean, mm -hmm. I have been at that institution since 87. And for the vast majority uh, of my time, and I've been in one sort of administrative position after another since I've gotten tenure, um, we had students hanging off the chandeliers. And uh, we were impacted. And, 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 and now it's the opposite. 
and especially as we know with this FAFSA problem, we're, we're all sort of biting our fingernails with regard mm -hmm. to our enrollment. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that it, we really do have to, uh, and Denise, I loved what you said, um, we do have to change and work with faculty around um, their role and work with everybody at the institution around their role, really. Um, but I think the, the thing that I'm really compelled to um, zero in on is I think one of the things that really impacts um, our retention rates, and they are significantly higher than a match comparison group, um, is that we really involve students as well as all of the kind of buzz and whistles around, um, you know, kind of student success, better advising, better onboarding, feelings of belonging, et cetera. But to really get back to what is the core mission of, of higher education, which is to develop the mind, to develop agency, to develop critical thinking, to understand oneself as a part of a bigger civic and uh, society and one's responsibilities to that. And so we redesigned the first two years uh, Hang on a second. We just lost your audio. Um, we can see your video, but your audio just went away. I'm so sorry. That's okay. You're back. All right. What does that have to do? Hold on a minute. Hold on. Hold Yo, on. You're, you're good. You're good. We can okay. see and hear you. Okay. Um, all right. Let me just... Oh, bu 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 uh, I'm sorry, Brian. Something else just turned on my phone. Oh, no, phones are busy creatures. Okay. Um, now I can't see you. Where are you? Uh, probably in the okay. There I am. There I am. There I am. Um, so I think that the the um, that curriculum it's a scaffolded curriculum where we really do a lot around. Um, agency and community and civic engagement. Um, and help people, young people, especially the young people that we are working with, who, for one, come often from an, uh, with an educational debt. So we do repeated practice of the core academic skills. But mostly what we do is put fire in their belly with regard to what an education can do for them, both as a human and as a uh, human economicus, which means human making money in the world. And, um, and that, that they're, what they have to contribute is unique and important and worth the delaying of gratification mm. and the hard work that comes with higher education. Um, and we also make it really clear that what we know about learning is that we don't do it alone and that we do it together. And so we have a very big focus on building community and helping students, um, helping education be fun and engaging. Mm. And um, so, you know, uh, and, our, and, our, and, and, and Denise, to your point, we do the same thing with faculty. I mean, we say a lot that, you, you know, faculty come and go on campus the way students do, at least at San Francisco State. And therefore, their connectedness to each other and to the mission of, the, of, of, of what we're up to um, is often lost on them, too. And, and you, know, it all, you know, the writing talks about higher education faculty having a contractual relationship and everybody's doing their own thing. Um, we have communities of practice where uh, faculty you know, uh, we put together a lot of, for each course they teach, we put together a lot of options, try this, try that. And then they talk to each other about it. And it is a buzzing conversation. And mm. they meet twice a month on Fridays, buzzing about what worked in their class, what didn't, um, and, and how they are helping. And, and the last thing I'll say, and then I'll, we can move on is that the, the idea of not only um, educating students about a particular content area, 
but educating students about their importance in our society in their role. And I think this can go across like we have an engineering program an edu- engineering academy and and we um, then got funded to hire a student success faculty member in engineering. Mm. And she has done this whole um, with our with working a lot with us. Um, how to restructure the first uh, year of engineering for engineering students where they we pull them out of themselves so that because they're often quite introverted intellectual types um, <laughs> so that they're in community with each other we feel that's a particularly important now post covid mm-hmm. and also mm-hmm. that we talk about the contribution that engineering makes no matter what form of engineering to making a more uh, just and equitable world Mm. And um, so, again, it, it's like igniting the passion that students have for whatever they're interested in, but certainly for their role they can play in making our society a better place for all of us. Um, and uh, when you hear our students talk about the impact of what, our curriculum and our student services, which provides a lot of continuity to students. They see the same people over and over again. Our faculty and our, it's a little bit like we're a startup, although we're not, we're Mm. old. But everybody has a passion for what they're doing. It's not just a job. Just like going to college isn't just going to school. It's about a future, it's about a commitment, it's about what's our purpose. Why are we doing this? And I just think we're, we're not doing enough of that. And if we did more of that, we'd, yeah. get, we'd get the heart for a faculty and students more impassioned and put more gas in their belly to do this hard work. Well, I, I asked what you're working on. And it seems like you are reorganizing higher education from top to bottom. Um, you, you, you have so much energy and so many ideas here. Um, and also by the way, Mary Beth, for the, for the time zone problem, I think the solution is obviously we all need to physically meet in that park right now. Uh, yes. <laughs> but here, let, let me, let me just the screen a little bit so, uh, we, we can see everybody. Um, and thank you both for answering, uh, my, my, uh, introductory question and thank you both for, for joining us. Uh, friends, I'm going to ask uh, our guest a couple of more questions, but I'd like you to be thinking about your questions. Uh, we've already heard some really, really good points about belonging, both the student belonging at institution and the student belonging in the broader world. Uh, questions of how to support students, how to inspire them, how to get that fire in the belly. Um, and we have some uh, we have some links as well in the chat. But uh, one question I'd like to ask both of you, um, and maybe we can start with, uh, with Denise, is how do you do this work of trying to uh, have students succeed and feel a sense of belonging, but to do so equitably? Uh, how do you do this without reproducing historical patterns of bias and prejudice? Can, can you give us a start in this? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that that is something that we, it, that it, we constantly grapple with. And frankly, I think um, part of the answer is that you have to keep in mind constantly that the system itself that we are working within was designed to perpetuate inequitable outcomes, right? It was designed to perpetuate the outcomes that we currently see. And so, for example, in the the communities of transformation that I I discussed, which at other institutions we've called equity champions, at Kent State, the regional system, we've called it belonging champions. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we do in that community of transformation is we talk about and we learn together on the many ways in which the system of higher education is designed to perpetuate inequitable outcomes and that we oftentimes um, unknowingly are contributing to those outcomes. And there's a foundation of that that we use as the basis then for helping faculty to engage in practices, evidence-based practices with their students in their courses that we know help to create spaces where all students feel as if they can thrive. So part of it is focusing on belonging. 
part of it is the ways in which we can communicate to students our own asset mindset about their capacities to be successful, mm. right? That we believe in them, that we are designing learning environments for them to be successful, that we understand that they are not all coming to college and to any of our courses from the same place. And that part of our responsibility is to help them to get the resources that they need in order to be able to be successful. And that that is a normative part of the college experience and not a sign that you do not belong or don't have the capacity to be successful. And I think what's particularly important about doing that work with faculty is that they understand that doing a, you know, sharing a story of a time when you felt as if you did not belong in higher education is not mm -hmm. going to mitigate all of the inequity that these students have experienced over the course of their education. That what we're doing can help, but that it is, we are not able and nor should we frankly be responsible for completely mitigating, right? We are not going mm -hmm. to be able to eradicate these inequities and we as faculty have a lot more power to affect change at a systemic level than we may think or than we may have in our classroom. And so when we think about faculty who have governance power, in mm -hmm. my state, we also um, have faculty unions, right? That they control the faculty handbooks, they control the curriculum, they control policies about who has access to which programs and which experiences. Uh, and that there's tremendous power to support a more equitable system, at least in our institution, if you sort of understand the bases for the, the ways in which the system works and the kinds of things that we can do to make the system more equitable. So these communities of transformation are, in the short run, focused on helping faculty to create spaces where all students thrive in their courses, but really what it's doing is trying to empower faculty to be agents of change in the larger system. And part of that is helping them to understand the nature of the system itself. Because I don't know about you all, but I have got through an entire PhD in human development and nobody taught me a thing about the system of higher education mm -hmm. or the history mm -hmm. of higher education. And this is, I think, something that is true for most of us, unless you go through a higher education graduate program. Um, and so many of us really don't understand Right. A lot of what, you know, I think at this point I have a, a bit of a better understanding of in 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 terms of the the ways in which what we really do in higher education is perpetuate privilege. Right. Much more so than we do support real learning. Right. And real transformation. Right. And I remember mm. that you were talking about in fire in the belly and we have to rethink everything if what we are trying to do is to create more equitable student experience and outcomes in higher education. And I believe faculty are the key to a lot of that. And they are often left out of the conversation about student success. Mm. Wow, that's a, that's a lot. Thank you. Thank you. I love that uh, way of trying to not completely solve the problems of, of prejudice and bias, but to try and address the prejudice and bias that the institutions have historically generated, but also that the students have, have experienced themselves. Um, in the in the chat, by the way, people are sharing uh, um, uh, links and some really good points about these different programs. Uh, Mary Beth, um, how do you go about this? How do you how do you help students succeed, um, and how do, how are you planning on helping them succeed across the institution in a way that is equitable and just? Well, you know, I think we have to have great compassion against what we're up to. Uh, what we're up against. Mm -hmm. I think higher education is facing a situation that K-12 has faced for many years, which is we are being called to solve the challenges of a broader society whose challenges we, as an institution, can only lean towards the light, can only, you know, do a small part towards that. And that is about this uh, economic and social inequality in our larger situation, which has our students coming to us with an educational debt, and many of them um, with um, personal trauma, because poverty is sickening. Poverty is, um, creates 
um, challenges in learning and everything else in a, in a life where, uh, you know, you're not, uh, you don't have full time to dedicate to five classes. In fact, you may be working half time or et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think we have to do and we do in Metro is, you know, people talk about not duplicating services. Um, I think we have to duplicate services, hmm. but I think we can do a stair step to services. For instance, one of the things that we do is we have a student center that's full of student, student upper class leaders who help other students mm -hmm. and they help them navigate mm -hmm. a bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. It's not that we don't have any staff in there, but we have a lot of students helping students. Mm -hmm. it, helps, it, it helps those student leaders find a se sense of purpose. So once they get out of our two years, they get a foothold in, in, you know, in work on campus, which all the data says is a good thing, as you know. Um, and also, it's, it's, um, we are so non-threatening. In fact, we are loving and caring. And the students are saying to the students, oh, I've been there. Listen, I'm going to walk you over to the bursar's office and we're mm -hmm. going to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. Or I'm going to walk you over to your advisor and I'm going to, we're going to talk it through together. And we do a lot of training with those students and they stay with us. So they get pretty good at understanding, as you said, Denise, not understanding higher education. They get, they get to understand. And then they, they say things that advisors wouldn't say like, Oh no, you don't want to take biochemistry while you're taking calculus for God's sake, you know, that kind of thing. So I think that we want to stare, especially in institutions that are underfunded. You know, San Francisco State, I think we get something like $17,000 per student. Stanford gets 90. They spend 90. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we are strapped. And so when you just call financial aid, guess what? Probably they can't spend an hour on the phone going through your FAFSA yeah. with you. Um, oh. that we just don't have the personnel to help in the ways that we, that, that they do at Stanford <laughs> and they do at some of the other places. Although those aren't, those aren't cakewalks either. It, the bureaucracy of higher education, the bureaucracy period, you know, healthcare, everything else is, is, is challenging. And, and so we also do a lot about agency in that, like, how do you do that? And one of the ways we really bring that into the classroom is we've been integrating um, contract grading mm. into all of our um, core classes. And, and we have a lot of people at San Francisco State interested in, you know, working with us to integrate it into theirs. And again, um, one of our, um, we had a student success tenure track hire in English that we were a partnership on. And she is a contract grading expert and she calls mm. that an uh you know many people in the literature call it an anti-racist approach to grading mm. because what it does is it, and and actually our uh, both our faculty like it and our students like it mm. but it's you know you you kind of say um the student says look this is a general education course i need a c plus or i need a b minus or i need a i need an a because i'm getting it want to go to med school or whatever and then you have a way, okay, if you want that grade, here's what you have to do. And it, so it, it, it gives students agency for all of the assignments. Which ones do they have to do? Okay. Uh, no. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm talking to Siri. Um, <laughs> um, and then the I'll other say the thing, name. <laughs> The other thing that is part of it is um, uh, the students get a lot, get more wiggle room with regard to timelines. Hmm. And what we experience is that probably a good chunk of our students might have a child that has an asthma attack at midnight the day before their grant is due in their grant writing class mm. and they're in the hospital all night with their kid mm. or they have you know some traumatic thing go down in their neighborhood a gun battle you know mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Or, you know, their car got broken into and they had to deal with it because it's the only. And so, you know, I have I was chair of a department of public health for many years. And and I remember personally having an experience of trauma close to me. And and Mm -hmm. when the faculty would talk about, well, if they don't have it in on time, then they need to have the consequences as if it's a real grant. So I don't give anybody a second chance. And I would just be like, no, uh, uh-uh. this is about learning. This is about, you know, and these are the students that we're, we're dealing with. And we need to understand what life is like for many of our students and how we support and, and, and understand and show compassion and that doesn't mean you don't have boundaries. There's not a point at which you say, you just didn't do it. I, I have to give you this grade. Or we don't say, you know, oh, my God, I'm going to stay in touch with you because you need to be in higher education. But right now might not be the time. But I see yeah. how smart you are. I see how much you want it. Yeah. Maybe now is maybe you need to take care of that. Can I mm-hmm. call you in a couple months and see how you're doing? Mm-hmm. So I think it's that level of humanity that we need to bring. Um, and I also think we need to understand that we can have all Ivy League white faces in front of the classroom. Um, uh, we need a diversity. Um, and I'm proud to say that I think that's changing in higher education now. Um, but we that is not to be underestimated. Um, and 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 uh, I think we know that. And then I think part of our interview questions need to be something like, "How do you understand these issues of bias? How do you how do you go at it in the classroom? Um, and write about it in your tenure file." And um, you know, at San Francisco State, we're majority minority at this mm-hmm. point, and mm-hmm. so. It's very conscious um, on camp. We're very conscious on campus. And it doesn't mean that, you know, as I go around talking about Metro, I don't hear it. You know, I don't hear, well, this is the gateway class. I don't hear, well, you know, these kinds of, you know, these kinds of, or something like that. I don't hear much. I really don't hear it much. But I don't mean to say it doesn't exist. And therefore, it has to be talked about and taken on head first. Wow, that's sometimes sometimes friends on the Future Trends Forum. We have guests like these who give us a, a what I think of as a graduate seminar uh, on their work. Uh, there are so many so many practices, so many ideas, so many practical tips in what you two just said that uh, I'm I'm in awe of them. In, in the chat, by the way, you have you have more fans. Um, we have uh, Dr. Lisa Durf says she wishes that she had uh, your approach, Mary Beth, when uh, she was in college. Um, uh, we've got um, um, uh, Matthew Pleur from uh, Quebec is saying uh, ownership of problems is usually where we fall hard in higher education. Um, and uh, Mathieu also refers back to uh, a previous session when we hosted then President uh, Paul LeBlanc uh, talking about um, the time in learning and how, uh, for him, poverty was a tax, uh, um, a time tax on the poor. Yeah. Uh, friends, I, I, I have so many questions to ask our guests, but this is the time for you. Uh, so if, you, uh, if you're new to the forum, um, just look in the very bottom of the screen and either click that raised hand button if you have a question that you want to ask on stage on video, uh, and you, you don't have to necessarily have a gorgeous background like uh, Mary Beth's, um, but you can uh, but you can join us uh, uh, at any rate. And uh, if you uh, would like to type in a text question, just hit the Q and A box and, uh, and and please type that in. Um, while, while people are thinking uh, about this and while people are taking notes, um, I have a, a, a question for uh, for the two of you, um, which is how how can you do this work? when uh, academia is under pressure politically and, and financially. Uh, 
I mean, Denise, you know, we're talking about Ohio, which is one that has been uh, squeezed by demographics and by economics for quite some time and has some pretty interesting politics going on. Uh, Mary Beth, the state of California has been wrestling with funding higher education for, well, arguably 40 years now. Um, and of course, your overall population is actually, the, the state of California's population has declined for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. how, how are you able to do this work under such pressures? Or is your work a response to those pressures? I think from my perspective, it is to some extent. I mean, I think the ways in which we're going about it certainly are impacted by those pressures. But I also think the work is more essential because of those pressures, right? When we think about the enrollment declines that we've experienced, one of the things that we know, for example, is that only certain kinds of students are accessing college at lower rates. And so students who are in lower socioeconomic status, right, who are in higher financial need, um, students who are receiving Pell Grants, for example, the number of those students has been going down significantly over the last couple of decades, while the number of more um, affluent students has been maintaining for, for many of us. And so the enrollment declines that we've seen are wholly due oftentimes to students who are coming from higher financial need backgrounds. And so what this says to me is that we have got to get better at serving these students. We have, if we want to push back against the pressures that I think are exacerbating the societal inequities that we're experiencing, that are exacerbating the divisiveness, that one of the best ways to do that is to provide more access to higher education to a larger cross-section of our population and to those who have been historically um, underrepresented. And so this work becomes more important. It, it becomes, frankly, for many of us, essential to the survival of our institutions, mm. right? So I am looking at a, at, a, at a regional system right now that I'm working with at Kent State that has seen an enrollment decline of approximately 50% over the last decade. Wow. Where our, um, the amount of money that we have to serve each student is, is actually, I think, less than $13,000 per student. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and looking at somewhat comparable differences, if you, if you then compare that to our flagship institutions, right? So the institutions that are serving the students with the highest need have the fewest resources to do that. And from my perspective, the only way that you change this is you educate people about the fact that this is happening. And part of that is educating faculties that they understand and that that is informing the ways in which they do their work. But then also, if we're doing our job well, we're educating students to be able to do the kinds of things that Mary Beth was talking about, to be critical thinkers, right, to be able to engage in critical thinking about the information that is being presented to them and about the value, for example, of a college education and even the value of it beyond the vocationalization, right? And one of the things that I think we're experiencing in Ohio is this real push to what I would consider to be narrow the parameters of higher education to workforce development, vocation, career, where things like critical thinking skills, things like, um, you know, cultural literacy, things like understanding our history are being devalued while these sort of very narrowly defined vocational skills are being overvalued. And, you know, that is something that is not lost on me, works to the benefit of whoever wants to maintain the current system. Right. So wow. we have to do this work. Yes, yeah. it, there's more pressure, but if we don't do this work, I don't think we get to the more just and equitable society that Mary Beth was talking about. It's a matter of our survival. Wow, wow. And, and not just the survival of higher education, right? I mean, I think we're really talking about the, the ways in which we can actually become the kind of nation and society that we aspire to be. Right, and the role of, of education for the public good in becoming that kind of society. Thank you. That's that's very, very powerful. Um, what a great answer. Uh, thank you. Mary Beth, do you want to add to that? Well, first, Brian, I want to say you can interview me every time, anytime. 
I, I, I like to talk about uh, uh, enthusiastic uh, uh, transitions. Thank you so much for your well, my, work. My pleasure. Thank you. It's very kind. Um, I, I, I really want to um, underline what uh, Denise said. I think it's absolutely true. Um, so, and that that's like the the high level perspective on it, um, and very, very, very true and wise. Um, uh, what I would say also is we just have to get really freaking smart and tenacious, those of us who are committed to this work. Uh, and I'd say one of the ways that, for instance, we um, have done a lot of work on um, how much we cost and what our benefit is. Mm, and so mm. we understand that because we retain students at the level that we do versus a, a very carefully matched control group, that we bring in $3 million a year to my institution mm -hmm. in tuition and state funds. And if our students began to perform as the students who we compare them against, uh, and that if, 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 if our program would go away, the, uh, the institution would be $5 million short um, over looking over the first four years and how much more our students persist. So there is, this is like a way of putting a sharp edge on what Denise said. There is a real, and, and every time I say this, I always want to, you know, there is a real benefit economically to doing this work. But there's also a real benefit to our society, as Denise was saying. So I always, I, I never want to start with that. But when I'm talking to an administrator who starts talking to me about, well, you, why do you need that drive? Why do you need the, that center? They can just go here. And I'm like, because they're met with, um, you know, what we know about communication is when the person you're talking to looks like you and is your age and, I remember saying to my kid one time, uh, are you disappointed that you have a lot of graduate assistants teaching you? She said, oh, no, mom, the graduate assistants are so much cooler than the faculty. Oh. <laughs> Classic. So, you know, we lose sight of who young people are, I think, as we get into where we are in life. And, you know, they like walking into a room where there's a bunch of young people that are going to help them. And then you make that the stair step to the, the person who's going to sign off on the red plan that they've worked with with three students who help them. Um, so I think that that um, the issue of really getting smart in um, evaluating like the work that we're doing um, towards the end that we're talking about so that we can show that we're just not, we're just not nice. We're just not humanistic. We're just not, you know, people who want a better world, that a better world is a better world mm. on all levels. Yeah. You know, we know that in, in societies where there's less income disparity, everybody mm -hmm. does better in health outcomes, even the rich. So, you know, I, I just think we need to not back off, um, get as much evidence as we can and do as much as we can. And it doesn't mean, I mean, I frankly am meeting with my provost this afternoon about, you know, what kind of cuts I have to take in order to um, uh, oh, wow. contribute to what's going on on the campus. And I will quote David um, Scoby, who said to me, you know, I'm an institutionalist. And I thought to myself, well, I'm an institutionalist, too. I love San Francisco State. It's always had, you know, a very important role in higher education. We are the, at the first college of um, ethnic studies. Um, I once did a, a program at AACNU with the then president where we talked about social justice being part of the marrow of San Francisco State. And we did a rolling scroll of all the books the faculty have written about social justice. And it went, went on and on and on and on and on and on. So I'm in a very, um, uh, uh, I'm in a very supportive milieu in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we really do have to defend ourselves economically. Um, you know, um, we have all these students working for us. If I had, if I was hiring all of them as professional staff, my budget would be out the roof. 
So yep. we're, yep. we're a low cost program. I think we're, uh, we did the data, uh, a cost study um, with uh, the help of some really smart outside consultants. And I think we are fit $500 more per student per year. Um, and which is like, that's the different, I, I mean, it, that's not a lot of money. No. Um, so I think we can do these things um, smartly without a lot of um, cost to the institution, although there has to be a cost. There has to be a cost. Uh, one thing we know from public health is that, you know, you can build coalitions, but if you don't have staff there to move things forward, right. It, it, right. you're not going to move it forward. So, you know, we have this center full of students, but we also have a very well-designed structure for how to deal with the students. And also we have a very well-designed structure for how to um, set goals and, uh, you know, strive for those goals. And we use those goals to, you know, like how many students uh, we have coordinators for each academy and we have goals for how many students they have one-on-one -on -one contact with. And, and yet it's also a very, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a very enthusiastic, it's um, a way of uh, working with people, but one in such a way that if I give someone assigned time to go be a coordinator and they're working from home, I'm really confident in what they're doing. So I think we just have to get yeah. good at the management, at the, at the you know, uh, doing the really good evaluation, setting up uh, goals uh, so that when people come gunning for us, um, we have a lot, of, a lot of ways that we can support the value for what we do and the importance of what we do. And we probably you know, have to be running uh, with a pretty tight belt because I think for a lot of this work and for higher education, I don't think we're going to see a big inflection of money. No, I don't see it either. I, 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 well, well, thank you again for, for, the, for the, well, the kind words, but also for that great answer to this question. I think people here are mesmerized with how much, um, how many plans you've both given us as well as how much inspiration uh, for being able to do this work. We, we have a few questions in the hopper, and I, I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to, uh, uh, to ask them. Uh, so let's, let's race ahead with a couple of these. Here's one from uh, CUNY, the CUNY system. Carrie Ann Smith asks, first of all, are faculty members on your campuses given incentives for participating in your initiatives? If yes, what drives those incentives? And the second question is, how do you measure the effectiveness of these initiatives? So um, yes to the first question small incentives. So the communities of, of transformation that I mentioned, Belonging Champions um, at Kent State, we provide a stipend of $1,000 for a semester long um, participation that involves a weekly meeting, that involves six hours of orientation, um, and that involves then engaging in these evidence-based practices and utilizing this innovative tool to collect real-time student uh, feedback on their experiences in the courses. So mm -hmm. it's a lot of work and a relatively small stipend. The bigger incentive, I think, is creating a space that's faculty value. So one of the interesting things, and, and we have seen this now, um, so this program is in five universities now, started at the University of Toledo when I was there, and we created out of the student experience project, which um, David Scobie put a link to in the chat. Um, one of the things we were baffled with was that it is the only program that even smacks of faculty development that I've ever engaged in, where faculty volunteered to continue to participate after the semester was over with no stipend. Mm. And so at Toledo, we had faculty who participated for three years every semester unstipended. Wow. And now at Kent State, we, um, we, had, we had about 12 faculty participate in fall of 2023. We had 82 in spring of 20, this current semester, spring of 2024, we're going to have another 50 in fall, 20 of whom are returning champions who are only going to receive a very small stipend for participating. 
And so the real, like the incentive, the, the stipend, I think, is both symbolic as well as sort of get people in the door. But when you create an experience that they find valuable, that's the real incentive, because what I'm looking for is sustained uptake and mm -hmm. sustained mm -hmm. change. And those kinds of, that kind of incentive gets you to sustained change. And yes, we do assess. Um, we have looked at things like course grades. So the student experience project found that grades went up in courses where, where faculty utilized these practices in these communities. Um, and that was particularly th true for students from historically underserved backgrounds. At the University of Toledo, what we found was that yes, grades went up and equity gap shrunk, but we had a stronger impact on persistence and retention for students. And in fact, Faculty, students who had taken at least one course with an equity champion over the course of their first year were almost twice as likely to retain through semester five as students mm -hmm. who did not have any faculty who were champions. And, you know, at first this was shocking to us, but what we realized was that creating these conditions for thriving that our champions are creating in the classroom creates a kind of inoculation effect for students. And this was occurring wholly over the course of the pandemic. And so students needed that kind of environment, particularly at that point in time. So the next time they faced a challenging experience, they were more likely to be resilient and to persist. And frankly, even to engage with the faculty who had been their champions in these courses previously, they had a network. Um, and we're starting to see those same kinds of impacts here at Kent State, as well as at other institutions that have utilized this kind of program. So we're tracking student level outcomes. We're also tracking faculty level outcomes. So how do faculty feel about the experience? How do they feel about where they are at the institution right now, where we are as an institution and our ability to be able to weather the changes that are ahead for us successfully and with each other. Um, that's very important to me as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that, that's so exciting, both the, the incentives and people working without the incentives, but then, you know, some concrete measurements. Mary Beth, we're almost out of time. Do, do, do you have 30 seconds that you can take a run at this question? I'm sorry. Well, first, well, first I'm going to mimic you, um, Denise. That's beautiful what you said. Thank you for your work. Um, I, I, I think the only thing I would say is that, you know, uh, the importance is to uh, really, as Denise said, create a meaningful experience. But I think you also will find things, I mean, we see that our faculty persist with us. We have a hundred courses. People ask to get involved with us. Um, there's enthusiasm and, and it really does make a better quality experience for the faculty, hmm. for faculty not to be isolated. Right. Teaching is an art. Teaching is something that comes, it's why we love it, because it comes not only from your brain, but from your core, it's your, it's your field. And when you get to talk to other people about how best to teach it, it, it brings in more creativity, it brings in um, more relationship. Um, and, you know, it bucks the trend in our society towards isolation and and loneliness and i and uh you know uh, uh fear of vulnerability fear of vulnerability and you know somehow we're just supposed to know how to do it by ourselves and sure. all of that so um I, I think that it really does feed the soul of the faculty as much as we are feeding the souls of our of our students mm. Oh, that's that's a that, those are both great answers. Uh, so, uh, just first of all, uh, Carrie Ann Smith, thank you for the clear, clear questions. Really, really solid ones. And Denise and Mary Beth, thank you for both of these. And now I, I have to say thank you both for being great guests. It is somehow three o'clock here on the East Coast, and you know, but noon, Mary Beth, at, uh, on, on your <laughs> lovely coast there. Um, I, I have to thank you both for being fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, guests. We've learned so much. And, and by the way, the, as, as part of the Paradigm Project, these are both part of the Change Makers Network. Um, so uh, if you check out the Paradigm Project website, you can get all kinds of information about that because these folks are literally making change happen. 
Um, and uh, it, from the uh, Bringing Theory to Practice team, Jillian Perry is a great person uh, to ask questions about this. Uh, she's a great organizer for this and also a good science fiction fan. So definitely a good person. <laughs> uh, she'll be there in the chat. Um, Fred, let me, let me ask you one last question. What's the best way to keep up with the two of you and your work? I mean, Denise, as you expand across Ohio and Mary Beth, as you expand across SFSU, how, how do we keep up with you? Uh, well, you can. I can put my email in the chat, and you're welcome to uh, to send me an email. I'm about the only Denise Bartell in the world, so if you Google me, you can get a pretty good sense of what I'm up to pretty quickly. Um, our, you know, our hope is that we will continue to help institutions to develop their own flavors of these champion programs with faculty. And so, if institutions are interested in learning more, I'm always happy to talk with them. You know, our goal is basically to help institutions create versions of these programs by faculty and for faculty that work given the context of their institutions. So, um, I would love to talk more about that. Um, I think those are probably the easiest ways. Thank you. Excellent. And, and Mary Beth, how about yourself? Um, yes. And, and, and uh, Brian, if you can put my, I suppose I could put it in the chat, but it's pretty easy. It's uh, love, L-O-V-E, at sfsu.edu. I'd love to hear from uh, any of you. Uh, additionally, um, our website um, is a good place. We've got lots of videos of both faculty and students talking about uh, what we do. Um, and um, I'm hoping through the Paradigm Project and various other places, I get to um, be part of uh, people who are envisioning a brighter future for higher education. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm honored to be uh, helpful to anybody who uh, might think I could be. Well, that's, that's very, very kind, very kind of both of you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, please, uh, Mary Beth, have a good afternoon. Um, thank you. Enjoy that weather. We'll be in touch again. And uh, Denise, good luck unpacking everything. Uh, <laughs> thank and, you so much. Um, thank you. And, and thanks to everybody here for being a great audience. Um, I, I think this has been a, a remarkable, remarkable uh, discussion. And my thanks uh, to Bring Theory to Practice and the Paradigm Project for, for helping host uh, these paradigm conversations. If you want to keep talking about this, if you want to keep talking about how best to support students doing this equitably, uh, here you can find me on all the socials, as they say, on Twitter, Mastodon, Threads, Blue Sky, my blog. Use the hashtag FTTE to make it easier to find. If you'd like to look into our previous sessions, including uh, our previous paradigm conversations, you can find them on the Future Trends Forum archive on YouTube, tinyurl.com slash FDF archive. And of course, it's just so good to be talking about these issues with you. Thank you all for your thoughts, for your comments, your questions, your experience. Um, it's really, really great to see us being able to turn higher education around and transform it in a positive way. I hope all of you uh, do well with your work this month, this beginning of May, and I hope you all stay safe. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.